Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first episode of Bruno Talks with. Uh, to I'm so glad that, that you are here and uh, that you waited so far. I announced this episode so much time ago, I think, and I just keep people waiting and waiting and they always kept asking me when this podcast will be on. But here we are today. Thanks for waiting. And uh, I have a very special guest today. We will be talking about um, engagements in, a, in a communities, uh, providing value, giving value in order to get value, but we'll be talking about a lot more. My guest is uh, very popular in the indie hacker scenes. I, I would say you probably read uh, a lot of his blogs, uh, you're listening to his podcast, you are reading to his newsletter. Um, he recently also published, self-published a book so my guest today is Arvid Kahl, the Bootstrap founder. And uh, yeah, if, you, if, it does, if that still doesn't ring a bell, maybe uh, Feedback Panda uh, product will ring a bell. We'll talk about that later. So hi. Hi, Arvid. How are you? Hey there. Wonderful. Thanks so much for having me on your podcast. It's quite an honor and I'm super excited to be able to talk to you. I think we've been tweeting back and forth quite a while on, on Twitter and I'm super happy to finally get to talk face to face. It's Quite, quite the pleasure. Yeah, the, the pleasure is mine. I mean, uh, when I had the idea of uh, starting this podcast, I was like, okay, I will send, I, I had some few names and I was like, why not? I will send him the, um, <laughs> the message and that was it, that how it went. But uh, yeah, we, will be, we, we chat uh, pretty much uh, even before that idea of podcast. So on Twitter, on Indie Hackers, and uh, especially uh, I'm following what Arvid is doing and it's kind of aligned with uh, the, the idea of what I'm trying to, do, to achieve with this podcast. So I remember uh, my innovation mentor from, from my company um, uh, recommended, uh, you must check this blog. And I went there and uh, the Bootstrap founder uh, blog, I remember even uh, downloading, I mean, porting all the, all the articles, previous articles that I haven't read to my Kindle so that I can read it again. And uh, I remember that Arvida was always uh, available, always cool, always like down to earth. So that's, that's what I really like uh, about him. So... Thanks again, yeah, for, for uh, join, joining today and being my uh, guest. What I would like to start the, the conversation and the, the whole this episode, uh, sometimes, uh, uh, I don't know, on some podcast uh, I was listening, you were the guest, or, or maybe it was a blog post, I don't know. But uh, you said something that I, that, I, that, I, uh, that I really like. So you said, if you want to be a successful founder, uh, you really need to, to, to help people, to want to help people. So mm -hmm. uh, that's, uh, that's uh, I, I assume that's the core uh, reason why uh, Feedback Panda also was a success. So maybe just a few words on that so that we can yeah. uh, start. Oh, of course. But I, I think in, in anything that you, that you want to be successful in, in anything that you want to do for a long term, you have to want to do it. I mean, that's like the, the basic for any job we take, for any career we go into, for any hobbies we take up. We don't take up a hobby just to quit it a couple of weeks later, right? That's, that's not the point of a hobby. It's always supposedly a long-term thing. And a business in particular is something that you, at least in most cases, will have to do for maybe a decade, maybe more, right? A, a business, we, we were lucky. We built our business within two years and then sold it. But that is, it's not always the case. There are businesses that take 10, 15 years to grow to a st stage, to a size where they can be sellable or, or are at a point where you're happy with it. But the whole point is you're in this, at least however long it is, the whole time. You're going to be in there 24 hours, seven days a week. You might have some sleep, hopefully, but anything else, your mind is going to be focused on the business. So when I, when I say, if you want to be a successful founder, you really need to want to help people, that helping people part is the foundation. Because if a business, the whole point of a business is to give value to your customers, right? If you, if you look at it from the economic perspective and what your customers are, are people, people with a problem, people within a certain group of people, mostly if you're a bootstrap founder, very likely going to be a niche audience, but they all have problems, they have different problems, and hopefully you can solve the, the most critical, the most common problems in that audience. So to be able to consistently solve somebody's problems, you, you can't fake that. You can't fake liking to solve somebody's problems. You have to like the people to begin with. Because 
I, I don't know, like to, to me, it was, we were serving online English teachers and in interacting with online English teachers, I just really, really enjoyed them. They were just so nice. They were sharing everything they knew. They were helping kids in China who didn't speak a word of English to learn this universal language, right? To, to speak English at a young age, to be able to get ahead faster in life. And they were not only sharing their knowledge with the kids they were teaching, they were also sharing their knowledge within their community. So we were in this, this whole teacher tribe, this tribal community where they just helped each other all the time. One teacher asked a question, I don't know how to teach this particular thing. And then 10 teachers jumped at it and said, well, I do this and I have a little puppet and, and then I go like this and I have this little song. It was just so heartwarming with the, the kind of energy and empathy that people had for each other. So that was a community that I love to serve because I knew that every little thing that I could do for these people would make a big difference in their lives and it would bring a smile to their face, right? And, and, and that's, that's what I cared about at this point. And looking back, in my life, all the projects that I did that were somewhat successful, maybe not as successful as Future Panda, but at, at least somewhat didn't implode immediately, were the projects where I cared about the audience on a deep level internally. Right? We, we built this little software here in, in Berlin where I live currently with a couple of friends. We had this um, local food marketplace that we wanted to build. But Berlin is a big city, like three and a half, four million people. There's very little food grown in the city, but a lot outside of the city, around the city. It's a pretty much a metropolis surrounded by a lot of agrarian um, countryside. So we wanted to make it possible for the farmers outside of the city to bring the food inside and the foodies and the hipsters to eat it and, and that kind of stuff didn't really work out. But honestly, we cared about food. I mean, I care about food. I love eating. I love cooking, all these kind of things, right? So to me, it was a, a thing I could relate to our customers. And while the project didn't go as far as we wanted to, we had to pivot and at some point it turned into like a B2B product. It doesn't really matter for, for this conversation, but it's still alive because we cared at that point. And Feedback Panda grew that much and that fast because we cared and we wanted to give all our customers as much of a value as we could possibly create. So that's what I'm trying to say, right? You have to want to continuously provide value to your customers. And that starts with really wanting to help them. Yeah, and uh, it also brings uh, motivations to, yeah, maybe sometimes to work over time, but uh, sometimes oh. it's not really a good thing, but it, it, it brings a motivation when you are creating something that uh, that's uh, um, actually someone, someone else is actually using it to solve their problems. I don't know, uh, be it like to, I don't know, to reduce the time of things that need uh, to be done or maybe to reduce the finance uh, costs or wh whatever. So uh, as a maker, uh, when, when you create a product and when and you see that uh, someone is actually uh, loving it and uh, you, you like to see that, you, to, to feel that, uh, uh, that you are actually helping people. That's, that's pretty much uh, motivational. And uh, yeah, um, I'm, always, uh, I'm also saying to people like, uh, okay, uh, first of all, uh, you probably should do uh, create some product that, uh, that you are aware of. Uh, pain points and uh, I don't know that that you are uh, familiar with that but uh, also th this is pretty much important so you really uh, it's not like your I don't know nine to five job and you are going there and uh, at the five o'clock you are closing your laptop and I don't know going home or now we are all, all working from home, so <laughs> maybe yeah, right. just staying a, home, a right? bit a bit different, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, but it, it is pretty much uh, Im important that that you uh, uh, like in every like in every business, like in every job, it's important that you like uh, that you love what, what you are what you are doing, and in this yeah. case, it's uh, that you like to help people. And uh, while you mentioned this, uh, so having some uh, pre previous projects. Uh, uh, I also read some, somewhere that, uh, yeah, Feedback Panda was uh, built and sold in like two years, but you have like 10 or even 15 years of experience of building another pro project. So yeah. this is also a pretty, uh, uh, let's say it's a huge period. It's like 15 years is like a, yeah. uh, a huge period. But the, the message here is that uh, it pays out in the end. Uh, it's uh, yeah. uh, People shouldn't uh, give up. Right. So... Do you have any, uh, I mean, uh, some I have a lot of thoughts on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I, I will just keep you talk, let you talk talk about that. <laughs> well, well, the most important thing to me is like looking back. It's always easy to connect the dots in your life, right? When I talk about my success right now, I talk about Feedback Panda. I talk about my full time job that I had just before that I at some point quit and went full time on Feedback Panda. And before that, I had all these little projects. I was consulting. I had the local food thing here in Berlin. And before that, I had a remote job for a Silicon Valley company in San Francisco where I worked for like a VC funded thing. And before that I studied computer science and, and even like political science and philosophy because I wanted to do something completely different. The, all of these things made no sense at that point because I, I went to university and dropped out twice. So you would call this a failure, right? You would call this a mistake in your career, but I dropped out and I found something else. I dropped out and I found something else. I found a job that gave me much more insight into coding than any university could ever do. And then I did my consulting. I learned how to talk to people, how to explain complicated things in a simple way. And then I had a real job, right, in, in quotes, where I was paid a salary so I could understand the internal dynamics of a business and not only how to build software in the business, but also how other per, uh, businesses purchase software from a business. So you learn all these little things, completely different things from having completely different experiences in your life. And only now, in retrospect, after having sold the business a year ago and having written and thought and reflected about it, do I see all these little traces of what I needed to know to get to this point? So you, going ahead, you don't see where the next dot is to connect, but in retrospect, you can always connect the dots. And the other thing, about this success of Feedback Panda. And it was a success, but it, it, was a, it was not an overnight success, right? It was this overnight success 10 years in the making. And it would not have happened without the previous experiences. So whenever I see founders struggling, I'm actually happy for them because that means that they're learning something in quite a hard way, very likely, in, in quite a painful way. And it might cause them some anxiety, some stress and some, um, yeah, some discomfort at least. But I know that there's some nugget of wisdom and knowledge in there that they will carry forward into the rest of their life. And if you have enough of these, and if you increase the opportunity surface that of your life, of your business, of your just your, your whole journey, then at some point something will land on that surface and you will turn this into a, a really, really interesting thing. So struggle is important for learning how to finally succeed. That's what I, what I think. So I'm happy with my choices in life. I'm happy to have dropped out of university twice and to have done all these different things. At the point back then, I may not have been, but now I definitely am. So I trust in your own instinct, I guess, is a, one of the other important things. Like make the choices that you feel are right because most of the time it'll end up being useful at a later point in life. Yeah, th these struggles are pretty much uh, helpful. And but as you said, uh, you cannot see it at that moment. Uh, maybe mm -hmm. you, you can, uh, I don't know, you, you, you can feel bad and I don't know, the your whole world collapsed or whatever. But uh, in the end, it, it, everything uh, builds up and helps you on the long run. So as you said, so for example, Feedback Panda was not two years success. It was 10 years in making. Yeah. So because you learned how to, I don't know, communicate how to sell, how to do this, uh, all of that things you learned on some, let's say smaller projects, maybe they mm -hmm. were bigger, but uh, uh, that's, uh, I, I was always saying people uh, go with a tiny project as well. I don't yeah. know. Uh, you want to test how it's launched, uh, how to launch on a product yeah. hunt launch a mini project just yeah. to, to have that feeling. But for the next time you will get, get a feeling and you will know uh, how to perform, I don't know, better or, or whatever. And uh, you also mentioned this uh, topic. Uh, uh, I, I wanted to, to mention it. Uh, uh, this uh, whole no, C, no CS degree and uh, mm. not, not uh, finishing the, the studies and everything. Uh, some people are thinking like, uh, okay, to do this whole, whole programming and everything, creating, uh, you know, to uh, co finish computer science uh, yeah. studies and stuff like that. It's definitely not true. And uh, yeah, so you are an example. So for example, uh, mm -hmm. I'm making you an example, but uh, this, uh, I, I recently saw a lot of people 
that uh, that are now realizing yeah i can start i mean we have internet and we have we can learn yeah. really a lot a lot of things but uh, to to take one step back i really want also to emphasize uh, this uh, what what you were previously saying that uh, uh, people shouldn't give up uh, even after first i don't know how many failures yeah. uh, if you want to go into that direction you should uh, uh, you should uh, you should just uh, be persistent be consistent uh, in that so yeah uh, one of my also next uh, one of my topics that i wanted to talk with you uh, you were building feedback panda in public mm -hmm. and it's pretty much popular even nowadays yeah. so it's kind of yeah. uh, totally open can you just uh, share yeah. share some well b and building in public allows you to do two things pretty much For, first off uh, it is it's a certain kind of transparency that does not exist in the corporate world of products. Like it's, it's different. It's very different from how Coca-Cola produces a new product or yeah, nobody knows what's in there really. Right. So there's, there's always this secret to producing products and building in public takes that and turns it around and turns the secret into some kind of public information that you willingly disseminate. It doesn't just leak, right? It's not just there for people to find. You talk about it and you engage your community with it. And particular for founders like, like us, like in the bootstrap founders, there's this whole community that has understood that we are smarter together. Like every founder has to learn everything anyway, but at least if they learn in public, if they build in public, they can find the problems much quicker because other people have experienced that. Like I'm just thinking about, it. I have like 7,000 followers on Twitter and sometimes I just really read through my, my feed and, and read all these little status updates by all these indie bootstrappers that were building their SaaS, their first SaaS, their second SaaS, doesn't matter. And there's a lot of content that is just the same. Ah, today my customers, this customer quit that I really wanted to keep, or I'm trying to figure out which feature to build next, or you know, all these problems that every single founder has all the time. And you see them appear everywhere and consistently. So being in a community and sharing where you're at and what struggle you're currently going through enables other people first to help you like they can support you with their knowledge because if you wouldn't talk about it, nobody would know that you have this problem. So you wouldn't get the perspective, but the, on the other side, which I think is even more important, it enables other founders who are not there yet or who are still debating if they should do it to see, okay, there's struggle, but there's also help. There's also this silver lining. There's like the, the hope, there's hope. And by being in, in public and by building in public, you share that it's doable. And by sharing, it becomes doable. I think it's just an amplification of your skills by allowing other people to help you and by helping other people by allowing them to see that it's doable. I think that's, that's what helped with Feedback Panda. And also, I, I got to be honest, like we had our product um, on Indie Hackers in, in the forums and we posted milestones whenever we reached something interesting and we hooked up our um, Stripe account to, to Indie Hackers. And that finally led to somebody being interested in acquiring us because the numbers were there. They saw that the curve was pretty sustainably growing. So for somebody wanting to buy businesses that are sustainably growing and that they can grow even more, having your numbers out there is amazing because they can now find you without you needing to show the numbers to them because they're, they're going to be there on Indie Hackers anyway, and they can just like, go through them. And some people take this even further and they allow insight directly into all of their numbers, how many customers they have, what the churn is, what retention is, like the customer segmentation. I would be cautious with that, at least at a certain point. But in the beginning, sure, go ahead, right? Share whatever you have. People might give you insight that you wouldn't be able to get without their, their, them looking at it. So um, it becomes a dangerous terrain. So I, I feel uh, it, you, you, can, you can run into trouble being too public. And you've seen this multiple times uh, over the last year. Buffers stopped sharing their open dashboard. Transistor FM start, stopped sharing their open data. They just share data more um, consciously now. It's not all access because they figured out competition can also look at that. People who want to compete with my business, who want to clone or build something similar, now have all this insight into my customer segments that I spent years painfully trying to figure out at some point there's too much information for others to prosper from 
for you to share, but you can still share more broad kind of numbers like your MRR and your rough amount of customers. And people will figure this stuff out anyway by, by talking to your customers if they want to, but you, you make it too easy for some if you provide all this information. But I, I love how many people are building in public and how many people are being celebrated for it. That's it's also what I do in my newsletter. Like every every week I highlight like three people who have some sort of success. Either I find some Twitter um, highlight that they post or I find it on Indie Hackers in a milestone. I, whatever I find interesting, I, I highlight in the newsletter and there's a couple more thousand people who get to be exposed to it, right? And that may allow them to grow even more and, and get to more success. And this whole community is celebrating people who build out in the open. And I can only recommend it. If you're a new founder, might just as well, right? Who, whose loss would it be if you fail in public? Well, now you have all this experience and you can build another thing in public until you actually reach this point that to success to have some some level of success yeah and uh, also being vulnerable well, if you are uh, i don't know if you are being open and transparent and mm -hmm. saying that you are a human being after all and uh, you are building things uh, it's pretty much uh, creating the bond with between uh, even with uh, with your early adopters with your customers and uh, so <clears throat> some uh, we are not robots we cannot i don't know just produce yes. produce produce uh, we, we are all making mistakes and uh, i agree with you with uh, what you said uh, about uh, being taking care uh, how much uh, amount of information you are sharing in your case it was uh, uh, helpful because you are sharing mrrs and uh, uh, you connected it uh, with the stripe which uh, gave it a lot of more credibility yes, because now you have like uh, okay i'm not faking it uh, this is yeah. the real the real numbers that's and right. uh, in your case it helped because they found you and you didn't yeah. uh, actually go there and uh, trying to i don't know convince someone that your business is doing great so yeah this this is also good uh, good good benefit uh, for for being uh, uh, open in public. Uh, yeah, sadly, sometimes it happens that people are copying someone else, but they are copying execution from yes, my point exactly. of view. Uh, uh, there is there, there are two different things, ideas and the execution. Sometimes, yeah. uh, and, and you need to, to, to balance and you need to put it all together perfectly that yes. to, 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 be, to have a successful product. But yeah. uh, th there's also uh, what I want uh, and what I'm saying to some of the people that are uh, starting and uh, that are being uh, somehow uh, that they keep their ideas only in their head. I'm saying like, just talk about it. Uh, go, go there and uh, I don't know, on some forums, on some communities, uh, talk about that, uh, see other feedback, uh, see uh, people are fear, uh, uh, thinking like they will steal my idea. And I'm saying like uh, uh, people are stealing great execution. You have, you can have great idea, but uh, other people are already having like dozens of ideas. And yeah. if they are, see that your idea might be potentially, they don't have time to do it. Yeah. But if you are open too much, and you are sharing your source code and sharing everything, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And then, uh, and if people uh, see that you are executing very well, then there is a higher chance on. Uh, that's, a, on that's a very important point. Like, uh, the initial distinction between the, the idea division and the execution, I think that's, that's a crucial distinction here because they can always copy the execution, but they can never copy you. Right? They cannot clone you. How much ever they want to do it, they cannot clone you as a person in PHP. It's just not going to happen. Right? So um, a founder that really has a vision, and that's where we come back to, you want to help people if you want to be successful. A founder with this vision, they will do the most they can, be the best expert in the field, be the most active creator of value that they can be to support those people that they chose to help. And that is something that you cannot out-clone. Like the, you cannot even out execute that as a bootstrapper might be different if a big business or a big company tries to like steals your idea or steals your execution and then just outperforms you with like 20 developers and a marketing team fund wise, right? If they just pour more money into it, always going to be a problem. But at that point you may be in a, too big of a market anyway. Right. Um, when I talk, I, I often talk about like finding the right audience for bootstrap business. And that starts with trying to find the Goldilocks zone. The zone that's not too big and not too small in terms of the size of your audience. Because if you're in an audience that has millions of people, you're trying to sell to millions of people. Well, some bigger business might also be in there trying to get those customers. 
But if you're selling to an audience of a couple, I don't know, a couple thousand, couple tens of thousands, maybe th that kind of size of an audience, podcasters, for example, I think would be an audience like this, um, particularly indie podcasters that don't have like big sponsorships going on and stuff, then you are in a pretty solid um, segment to build a bootstrap business in and you will only experience clones by other bootstrappers. And that's what Transistor ran into. They were sharing too much. So now other people were trying to build Transistor or something similar and they kind of cut down on their information diet, I guess. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the point is that I'm trying to make that if you really love what you're doing, you will be the best or you will be one of the best in executing. And the thing is, and that's, that's a, I think also an important thing to think about, if somebody clones your business and they turn out to have a better product than you, then there's two things that could happen in your mind. Either you get super upset and oh, why didn't I think of that? Or you take it in and say, okay, here's somebody else who seems to have understood more than I did about this market. Here's somebody else that I can learn from. Right? Now you are actually supposed to act on this and make your product better. Because if you really want to help the audience, then somebody building a better product than you is actually something good. Right? And if, if you fail to build the best product, well, then maybe you need to learn more about your audience. Maybe you need to understand more, be more part of this audience, become a part of the community even more and engage with people and really get what they need. Because if you build something that they don't need, well, then it's a pointless product, right? Then you build something for the wrong people or something wrong for the right people. It depends on how you look at it. But if you, if you build something that people really, really critically need in their lives, then nobody is going to outperform you because you've understood the most that can be understood. And it's only, yeah, the people with a lot of money that could maybe outmarket you in, in this kind of space. But like you said, if you are vulnerable as a founder and you're open about it, then your customers will value that. Because everybody has this one entrepreneurial person, either in their family or in their group of friends or just somewhere around them. They all know the, the person that started a business at some point or have like a, a grandpa that has a farm or that went to a farm when he was a young man and built his fortune and then went to the city. You know, all these stories, there's always somebody relatable who's entrepreneurial for every single person. Either that or they know like Elon Musk, or, you know, like they just know somebody that is entrepreneurial and does something useful. Um, and if you can be the person that comes to mind when they think about entrepreneurial life and their entrepreneurial career, and if, if the, that one entrepreneurial person in their family comes to mind when they compare it to you, that's a win, right? Because they can relate to you immediately on, on a family level, on a friendship level, not just on a business, on a value exchange level, but on, a, on an emotional, empathetic level. So being public and being open allows you to do that with your customers as well. It's not just with other founders. It's also with your customers and how they relate to you. We had a lot of communication with our customers that changed in style immediately. They reached out to us and complained, ah, why doesn't this work? And I said, well, Feedback Panda is just me and Danielle. I'm going to get to this immediately. I will solve your problem. And then I would immediately start typing away and fixing the bug and deploy quickly within half an hour and tell them, okay, thank you for your report. I fixed the bug. I released a new version. Can you please refresh your page? And I imagine that their jaws just dropped at that point because the kind of customer service that they knew before that was Comcast or T-Mobile, you know, those things where you call and they hate you for half an hour and they tell you about it. Totally different story. All of a sudden they understood, oh, there's a person here. This is not just like a, a computer talking to me or a person that hates their job. Here's somebody that cares about me, cares about me enough to spend 30 minutes on my problem, solving it for me. We turned those people that came in with both middle fingers up and we turned them into product evangelists for our brand. They started talking about Feedback Panda on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. They've made videos doing tutorials for our product just because we were there for them when they did not expect it. And that is also the kind of personal thing that you can do as a founder that no big business will ever do. It just doesn't scale for them. It definitely scales for a bootstrap business. And it scales when, you're, when you want to connect to every single customer because you need to validate your product, right? Before you build it, while you build it, when you build new features, when you test new features, you always need to chat with people. And chatting with people who like you is so much more interesting than chatting with people who hate you. Yes, <laughs> to tell you yes. that. 
So yeah, definitely bootstrappers have this uh, advantage over these uh, big, big companies because they are serving millions and bootstrappers are serving like, I don't know, in the beginning, if you are having like five customers, that's pretty much uh, uh, even, even having that first customer is yes. pretty much a big milestone. And, and uh, the important thing is that uh, those first customers are really like your product. And you, uh, otherwise, they wouldn't be your customers. I mean, they, they will be like, well, what is this? So uh, like all other people who are just ignoring you, maybe not ignoring, but uh, uh, they don't want to spend time to test your product because they don't have. But if, uh, if, you really li if they really like your product, they, they will stick with you. Even if, uh, I don't know, some um, bad situations happens or bad times happens and uh, uh, important is to to interview this these uh, uh, customers because they they can tell you really a lot of, of that uh, what what they are enjoying in your uh, why is your product uh, so good for them what what's uh, and uh, you have this uh, uh, you, you said uh, for example uh, just uh, provide uh, feedback or support like in 30 minutes or one hour so that that you just uh, have them um impression that you are actually building uh, the software to to solve their yeah. problems Absolutely. and uh, you, you also mentioned uh, this uh, uh when we talked uh, about uh, stealing uh, the ideas uh, that uh, you cannot uh, steal the vision so you can if founder have has a vision uh, i don't know to draw the, the rocket somewhere. I read it somewhere that they say something like, you can steal my uh, rocket, but you don't know on which planet I'm heading. Yeah. So yeah, something, exactly. so, something like that. Uh, if, uh, especially if a founder is uh, pretty much involved in the problem that they are solving. Yes. Um, you, you cannot, uh, you cannot uh, steal, steal that vision. Uh, the founder will always uh, know a bit, uh, a thing or two more than you, than you do. And uh, uh, it can get, um, uh, it's also a thing about speed and velocity, so it can uh, give give them boost them with, with some speed, so that they also. But the, the velocity in the end is big, uh, uh, important, so that the original founder will have that. Uh, I don't know. In the end, uh, they they will uh, take uh, take that product uh, and make it uh, something something big. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, we, we already talked uh, along, but uh, the original uh, title of the episode was Give What You Want to Receive. And uh, I, I believe you uh, experienced that mostly when you published your book, if, uh, mm -hmm. if I'm correct. So yes. you are for a very long time, let's say on a giving end. So you are like uh, providing value, writing on, I don't know, on your blog, on your, you are providing, you are sharing your experience to everyone else. But when it comes to uh, when when your book was released, you felt that uh, the reaction, and uh, so maybe maybe just some thoughts on that. Yeah, it was it was incredible. I, honestly, I, I did not expect the kind of response that I got. Um, now, in in retrospect, I understand kind of. I, I think I understand why people were so happily engaging with me. But yeah, I, I mean, I, I started the the blog, the Bootstrap Founder, in November of 2019 because we had sold the business around July and then there was still the transition period where we had to hand over everything, hire our replacements and make sure that everything works for the people who acquired us. But in November, I felt I had enough time to finally, after years of trying to get some time to write, to actually start a blog. So I had, I always wanted to write, but if you run a business 24 hours every single day for years, you don't find time to sit down and relax. It just doesn't happen. Not with 5,000 customers that may or may not have a little problem every now and then. Just there's no time. So in, in November, I started writing and I, I had this whole list of blog posts because um, even though we were... We were on vacation. Danielle and I, we went to, to Africa and had a really nice vacation for the first time in many, many years. Um, but I still, my mind, the whole time, oh, open a Notion document, put in a, a blog post title because this is what I want to talk about in the future. My mind was still kind of in this whole work um, mode. And I had this list of blog posts that I wanted to write and just started writing in, in November. And I had a couple done after, after a week, like 10 of them. And a, a week or two took me, uh, I mean, I have a lot of time, right? We sold the business. All of a sudden, you don't have to do anything anymore. That certainly is a lot of time to write. So I had 10 of these things written, started the blog. And then I thought, hmm, I am a lazy person. 
that's that's like the the most basic thing about me is that I'm quite lazy when it comes to work because I want to avoid stuff as much as I can. If I can automate it, I will automate it. The whole business was highly automated because I just didn't want to do stuff. So um, even the shirt I'm wearing says my, my Patronus is a sloth, right? So I am lazy. I'm a very lazy person. So knowing that you can only meaningfully help people if you do it over an extended period of time, I needed to build some sort of accountability system for myself. And that's what the newsletter turned out to be. Because I knew if I want to keep releasing a new blog post every week, I have to force myself to write one. <laughs> I'm just that there will be weeks when I just want to, I don't know, game or, or read a book or just sleep, right? That'll happen. So I needed something every Friday or every day or every one day in the week, but turned out to be Friday for me, where I would release something and something needed to be there. I would need to write something every Friday. So the newsletter happened. And at some point, the podcast happened too, because it's essentially the same thing. It's a weekly thing where I talk about what I wrote about and I just force myself to do it because there's an audience of people who want to listen to it. So apparently I have to provide them with something. So continuously providing value every single week is what I did because I felt this is how I help people the, the most, how I can help people the most. And I just in like, just this week, I think, it's the 40th episode of my newsletter. It's the 44th episode of my podcast because I've recorded a couple um, in advance. But 40 weeks of releasing content, that creates a lot of content. And that creates a lot of repeatable expectability, right? People who come to my Twitter, they expect a new post every Friday. People who come to my blog, they expect something new every Friday. Same for podcasts. So over time, I grew an audience of people who expected me to deliver and who saw me deliver stuff every single week. Started out with 400 followers on Twitter over the last 10 years. That's the amount of people that I had um, following me on Twitter. And then when I, I think when I released the book that was the 29th of June in, in this year, 2020, I had 4,800 followers at that point. So it was already 12x the amount of people that I had when I started out. Today, I have 7,200, which is... 15, 16 X, the, the amount of people, I think. Don't quote me on that math. I, I studied computer science, but I dropped out. So this is a good, good reason for that. Um, yeah, anyhow, the, the whole point is it slowly grew. It grew significantly, but it grew slowly over time. And I never asked these people anything, right? I posted, I communicated, I celebrated people's success. I tweeted, I retweeted, I engaged because I liked that. Not because I hoped that they would eventually pay me money. But people have the concept of reciprocity. They understand that if I take, I will need to give. And if I give, I will, somebody needs to take. So, um, um, or I will, I will eventually be able to take. And when I released the book, I expected to maybe sell 20 books on the first day because there was a couple of people that said they would buy it. So I would hope they did. Um, so I posted my tweet with all, all the information I could put in there, all the, the kind of stuff that worked that worked that went in there. And even before I had shared a lot of information about how working with the editors was and how the, the structure of the book came to happen, what tools I used, all these little tiny things. And then all of a sudden, the first day, there's this mass of people who just retweet my, my thread, who share pictures of themselves buying the book on Amazon, just really screenshot the little, you have purchased the book, who load it onto their Kindle and take a selfie with it. It was incredible. It was just the most amazing day. I sold 350 books that day. That's 17 times of what I expected to sell. And um, in the first week, I sold 1,000 books, like literally um, at, yeah, seven days and 20 minutes after the thousands book went off of Amazon. It was incredible, like really. And I, I attribute this to the fact that I had accumulated so much goodwill in all these people that I helped that they could not help but help me out and give me 10 bucks for the book or 28 for the paper bag, right? It, it was just people really felt this is something that I should support because it has helped me already so much um, over the last couple months. The blog post, the podcast has helped me in some way, maybe a little way, maybe a big way. I had people tell me, that they significantly, that, that what, I, what they read made a significant impact on their business. I had other people tell me that I already knew this. Well, yeah, of course, some people, some people know, 
um, and already have a lot of knowledge, but that's not my audience. My audience is the people who don't, right? The people who are working on their first business, who are trying to understand what kind of problems might lay in the future. And that's, that's what, the, what Zero to Salt is about. It's like really understanding from the first thought of, I want to be an entrepreneur until you sell the company, what kind of problems may lay along the way. And of course, it's not complete. Like these are my problems and the things that I know about, but there's more. Hopefully not too many more, but there's more stuff along the way. So every journey is, a, is an individual unique journey, but at least understanding many things that might come up is, is an important part of being prepared. So having sold so many books and having people share, there was one guy who shared a photo of his child, his newborn child holding up my book. Like that is the kind of audience that I have. And I'm so grateful to have these people just be, be happy for me in having accomplished this and sharing this and helping me build an even bigger audience and help more people in the world. So um, that is, yeah, that, that is the, the kind of community that you build slowly by providing value consistently. So, uh, yeah, I remember that, uh, that you are building, let's say, building tension for that uh, book, book release. So you are mm. saying like, okay, now we are going to the, I don't know, people are going to read it and proofreading and stuff, stuff like that yeah. and the editing. And uh, you were an announcing uh, slowly that, uh, but the, yeah, it's not uh, the main reason for the, for the big success. Uh, uh, that that you built some kind of tension the, the 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 reason as i see it is the the exactly what you what you are saying so that reciprocity so uh people uh felt like okay now now it's the time to pay back but not only uh not only like uh, okay now here's a 10 bucks uh thanks for everything that you did mm -hmm. but uh people are like uh, waiting to see okay what's what's in that book so here's mm -hmm. a 10 buck i want to see now what's in that mm -hmm. book i mean you also have this uh, um let's say free version of book but there's yeah. this uh, part of the and uh, i haven't uh, finished uh, finished reading the, the book but uh, probably in a book there is a lot more but yeah. uh, and we all know through your blog post and the newsletter what to expect in that book but uh, mm. it, the thing that it's wrapped up and uh, it's uh, kind of one piece uh, uh, yeah it's uh, but what i what i also wanted to to mention uh, i also asked you some time ago also why it's so cheap <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's that's a question you love to hear <laughs> yeah well i'm um, honestly we, we sold the business we sold the business a year ago so i didn't write a book for money right i didn't write the blog for money and i don't write the newsletter for money you will not see a sponsor in there i, I tried uh, didn't i didn't really didn't, didn't go too far and i didn't really enjoy that i just want to be able to talk to people that's what i have the newsletter for share the links i like and share whatever i've written that week that's what I care about, not to make 50, 100 something bucks. It's really not in the money for me. And that's also um, why I priced the book the way I priced it. I mean, the print version is 28, right? Because the, the cost of um, having a print on demand book that is 500 pages, it's quite significant. If I wasn't as verbose and I couldn't, could have written this in uh, 200 pages or something, then maybe it would be cheaper. But the print version at least is kind of bound to the Amazon, the cost that Amazon inflicts on people who self-publish at this point. But um, 10 bucks for the, for the digital version, I said because I wanted to make it available. I just really wanted to make it affordable for people who are in a position of not being able to afford a $70 ebook. I mean, I could have easily priced it that high. There are, there are lots of professional ebooks in that space or 40 bucks, something like this. But... Um, Again, I, I don't want to exclude people too much. And I, I see this too in, in my audience, my particular, my, my blog audience, because um, my analytics, I can see that my, my big, the biggest part of my audience is United States. And the second biggest, biggest part is India. And if I think about countries like India and other countries in the world that are not part of like the big industrialized 10 or something, well, there's a lot of founders there too. And now kind of the, the global paradigm has shifted. Everybody can start a business from their living room, like literally, right? They can start a business, um, use Stripe Atlas to incorporate in Delaware, you, uh, get, a, get a bank account and a Stripe account and just build something and charge money to people everywhere in the world. Like 
if I can help people in countries like that to just get some insight into the kind of problems that they might be facing so they can be prepared, well, then, then I'm not going to charge 40 bucks for the book. I'm just going to charge nine, right? If that's or t- 9.99 or whatever. And I might go into deals at some point, but right now I feel for a book this size, this is a fair price. That still makes it affordable for people who may not be in the position to buy books whenever they want to be. So that, that was the, the motivation behind that. Because honestly, it's about helping at this point more than about selling books. I mean, it's a nice side effect and I really enjoy it. Enjoy being an author. But if I can help people, that's, that's why I did it. And this is the reason why you are first guest in my podcast. So <laughs> I really wow, like so it, the, the way uh, how, you, how you think about and how you actually uh, always want to help uh, others. So, yeah, I mean, the book is uh, 500 pages. And uh, if you give it for free, it's kind of sending some kind of uh, yeah. um, uncertain message. So what are you... I mean, it's kind of a real book. I mean, 500 pages is 500 pages. So, right. so and uh, you have to put, put some price. And uh, I think also that it's pretty, pretty much uh, affordable. You mentioned um, a few moments uh, ago uh, about this uh, consistency in writing. So I'm also mm-hmm. saying uh, that uh, on, on my Twitter, uh, you can some, sometimes uh, hear see me that i'm trying to motivate people to start writing not because that they will uh, build number one seo blog that will yeah. appear in a ranking but uh, start to get the habit of writing because uh, i think uh, the writing is some some kind of a live hack uh, that uh, helps you improve improve yourself and it's it can, it can also help you uh, with with building your product because uh, you, you will encounter, I mean, you will write cold emails. You will uh, write sometimes copy of your landing page. You will write, you will write a lot of things. And if you, if you start writing a blog or any kind of, uh, I don't know, text, any kind of text that you write every day or every week or whatever, it can significant, significantly uh, improve your uh, communication skills because the more you write, uh, as, I, as I often say it, uh, the more you write, the more you delete. And that yeah. deletion part is also important. So if you write like this email, nobody going to read it. So, yeah. But if you, uh, if you have some experience uh, of, uh, of writing uh, behind you, then uh, it, it, it can be, it, doesn't, it, it won't be an overnight change. So you yeah. won't uh, w- woke up and say like, I'm now a successful writer or I can now uh, write a su- successful copy of my landing page, especially if you are one man show in a product. So if you need to deal with marketing, if you need to deal with, uh, I don't know, sales and uh, everything. So it, it is pretty much important. And uh, you, you also set yourself uh, this uh, kind of obligation to, 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 to yeah. deliver the every Friday or every, I don't know, uh, one, one uh, day, day in a week. So it, it is pretty much important. And that's why I'm uh, talking to people, say, saying to people, start writing blog. Doesn't matter which platform, just start writing. And uh, people are like, I don't, uh, I'm not an expert to write. You don't have to be an expert, <laughs> write for yourself. Yeah. So this is, uh, this is the, and, uh, you also said while you were in uh, Africa that you had this uh, written down and I don't know some somewhere the the ideas. Uh, I'm also keeping the bank idea. I don't have unfortunately I don't have too much time recently, but I'm writing. Whenever I I hear that, uh, whenever wherever I realize that I I'm able to speak more than five sentences on some topic. Yeah. I w- wrote it down so because if I can speak about it more than five sentences, I can write, I don't know, 10, 15 seconds blog. Yes. But for sure, I can expand it and I can turn it into the blog. And that, that way, you don't end up in, the, in this um, crisis of not knowing what to write next because you already have like 10 to 15 ideas and you are just picking what's the right time, to, to, what's the right topic for, for this time. Yeah. Can I, can I say something to this? Because it's, it's, it's absolutely important to me, the whole topic, both of writing itself and of allowing people to understand that everybody can write. Um, what I really like what you, what you just said is that you don't have to be an expert to write. And I would say nobody was an expert when they started, even the best writers, even Hemingway, even the people you find on Twitter that are like, like Sahil, who have these pristine tweets and stuff. Yeah, these... P- tweets are pristine after 50,000 tweets that were not, right? The whole point of writing 
for yourself or a blog or whatever is to learn how to write better. Just like if you, if you are a software engineer, at some point you were not a software engineer. And if you remember your first foray into coding, it was horrible, right? You built things and they failed all the time, didn't compile, you missed semicolons, you didn't understand what a for loop was, all these little things. Right now, it seems like, huh, you're, yeah, you gotta learn. Writing is the exact same way. You start writing and it's really horrible. And then the magic of writing is that you can always revise, right? That's what you said with the deleting. Nobody writes a great piece of work on their first draft. Just does not happen. You write something and you take parts, you look at them, uh, not so good. You remove them, you write them again. You scrap the whole thing, write it again, write other things, change things. A month later, change a phrase. Like writing is just as organic a process as building a business or as writing a project in code. Write, writing code is like writing a text. It's just for a different audience. It's always what I feel. Like you write code for a computer, you write prose for a person. And everybody should be doing this because not only does it in, improve your skill of writing professionally, it improves your skill of thinking critically. Because um, I've been reading this book called um, How We Sleep uh, by, by Walker, about like how, how sleep happens. And he's, he's talking about REM sleep, the rapid eye movement stuff, where, um, how dreams happen in that state. And being able to write is like dreaming, but you have a record of it. Because when you start writing, your mind goes into spaces where it hasn't been before. It, re it connects different things creatively, which is like dreaming, but all of a sudden you don't forget it immediately when you wake up because you've actually written it down. So writing is the conscious form. I mean, it's really not, but to me it is the conscious form of dreaming with, in a way that you can actually salvage the thoughts that you had while you were exploring a topic. And I think for anybody who wants to do something meaningful and creative in their life, that is what you want to do, right? You want to have a record of your thoughts. You want to have a record, like you said, your five to 10 sentences. That alone, writing that down means now you have a persistent record of your thought, which might be gone a couple hours after you had it if you don't write it down because you have so many other thoughts and you can use it again. Here's value in its rawest form. And to write is to crystallize that value into something meaningful for other people. I would highly recommend the same thing. Write for yourself, write a journal. If you have to, if you don't want to write a blog, write a journal, but write, absolutely. And also uh, it, it comes in handy. So for example, if you write something on some topic and uh, after some time, uh, some discussion pops up and uh, you don't have time or I don't know, energy or whatever to explain all over again, uh, you can just, uh, I don't know, point, uh, say a few words and say like, okay, I already wrote on, on, the, on this topic. And especially yeah. if it's uh, kind of... Uh, a uh, successful uh, article. Yeah. So I have now two words that may uh, you may talk a lot about, about them. I will just say two words. First one is tribe. Second mm -hmm. one is niche. Right. So right. <laughs> I believe that you can say a few words more more than two words on, the, on those. Well, yeah. They, they both they both kind of are important um, vocabulary for a founder to understand how an audience should look particularly if you're indie hacker or bootstrapper. Um, and, and you should always start with your audience anyway, right? Like that's this whole thing that, that I've been consistently saying, both in the book and in my podcast and in all my writing, start with your audience, find a critical problem, solve it in a way that um, works with their workflow and then build a product that happens within the medium that they already use. It's like the most dense version. Um, and the audience is where you start because if you can validate this, there's a group of people that exist and I would really like to help them, then you will find some problem that they have and you will find some solution to that problem that you can actually sell to them, right? There is validation along every single step. If you start with the idea, then you kind of have to figure out, is this a problem? And to figure out, do people have this problem? It's always questions, questions, questions. But if you start with the audience, you funnel it ever more narrow into some kind of product that you can build a business about. And the most likely kind of audience that you can built a successful bootstrap business for is a niche audience, is an audience that is somewhat homogenous in the, the kind of problems that they have, the kind of work that they do, the kind of industry that they work in, right? People that are quite similar to each other. And you can solve one of their most commonly ha held problems, that critical problem within a niche. If you can get to that point, the likelihood of success for your business just increased incredibly compared to, oh, I have this cool idea, Tinder for cats, 
right? Where you don't really know, is there an audience even? Is that, do people pay for this, right? If you have a niche audience, an audience that is proven to exist, that is also very similar that you can be part of. Like, I don't know, people who host a podcast or people who have a nice microphone or people who, I don't know, wear glasses uh, that are not too fashionable. You know, there's all kinds of audiences and most of them are, are niches within a bigger audience. And you don't want to go for the big one. You want to go for the small one because you can sell to all the people in the niche. You can expand yourself into the niche. You can fill out the niche and you can command the niche. That's always an important part here too. And for a bootstrapper who doesn't have millions of dollars in marketing laying around, being in a niche um, is, it makes it so much easier to target the people that you want to sell to. And the best kind of niche is a tribe. Right? If, you, if you look at the definition of a tribe, um, I like the one given by Seth Godin, who wrote, wrote a lot about marketing in tribal communities. He says a, a tribe is a community of people who have a shared interest, they're highly interconnected, and they're following the same leaders. That's kind of the most basic definition of a tribe. I'm paraphrasing, right? But um, that is, a, like we experienced this with Feedback Panda. The teachers that we served, they were a tribe. Online English teachers, gigantic tribe, hundreds of thousands of people teaching through some uh, of the Chinese schools that we supported. Others teach through LearnShip or um, there's, uh, what's, what's that other business called? Um, Preply. Um, all, there's all these kind of schools out there where people who know a language teach other people how to speak that language, right? And for English teachers, that was a gigantic tribe. And they all were connected. They were all in the same Facebook groups. They were all in the same Instagram communities. They, ha they hung out on Twitter, some of them. They were all in these forums that you've never heard of. There's a English as a second language teachers forum, the eslteachers.com has like, I think 70,000 people just talking about ESL teaching online. And these communities exist and they are super interconnected. There's a lot of reputational dynamics in the community. There's people that they follow, there's people that follow, there's people who share their knowledge in there and they all share everything they can share to help other people become a better member of the community. And I think that is what you wanna serve. That kind of community is the most successful community you can serve because for us, we shared, I mean, our, our whole marketing was word of mouth. We never did paid marketing or we tried and it didn't work. So we started by posting, literally started by commenting on a Facebook post where somebody asked, how do you deal with student feedback? And Danielle said, well, I use Feedback Panda. <laughs> well, I also made Feedback Panda, but I also use it, put a link there. And then people started coming to our product. And then people started to understand that this was a good product and they shared it. Somebody else would ask, how do I deal with feedback? I'm a new teacher. I just got hired. How does this work? And somebody would come in reliably a couple minutes later, a couple hours later. Well, I use Feedback Panda. Here's the link. We didn't even have a referral system at that point. But people already found it so useful that they thought they needed to share this with other teachers. And we implemented a referral system later. Didn't even make a, make, make a big difference in the amount of sharing. People still shared the original link, the link with the referral component. Didn't matter to them. They could get something out of it, but they were just happy to share it to begin with. And that's what a tribe does. A tribe shares good stuff, right? There are loose communities out there. And I would say, if you think it's sports fans, they are a niche, but they may not be a tribe. Like Arsenal fans, they are a tribe, right? Or people who like one particular kind of sport might be a tribe, but sports fans are loosely associated. So what, like a hockey fan might not necessarily communicate much with a soccer fan. But if you go into these communities, all of a sudden you have a much more engaged kind of communication. And that's the group you want because your marketing is going to be much easier. People will help each other when your product experiences a problem, right? We have this a lot, well, hopefully not a lot, but hopefully you're not, you're not going to have it a lot. But if you have downtime in your product, having people saying, oh, don't worry, they always fix this within half an hour. That is significant, right? Having this a, a kind of public appearance that you don't produce, other people produce it for you. That happens in a tribe. And for that, you need to find the right niche. So they're interconnected in a way, but the tribe is, I guess, more the communicational structure and the niche is more the, the informational interest-based structure. But they're, they're very well connected and the best thing you can do is to find both at the same time.
Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the clarification. I, I think uh, it's now more more clear to people and uh, uh, and the, the benefits uh, of, uh, of of those uh, interconnections. Um, I have two more topics, and I would like sure. to slowly to to um, to come to an end. So here, uh, f first one is uh, I would like to talk about burnout and the. Mm -hmm. um, work uh, balance of that work and especially I know that uh, um, I mean I specifically picked that topic because I know that you and Danielle worked on this and uh, uh, I don't know maybe you hired someone uh, maybe freelance for some part but for the 99% you are and yeah. uh, maybe some words on that and uh, also uh, some people are uh, sometimes you can hear those, those questions uh, what would you say to yourself back in 10 days? But I don't want uh, that kind of questions. <laughs> I want uh, some real stories from 10, 10 years back then. Do you have some kind of uh, any uh, any moments where, where you said like, why not and throw everything in fire and I don't know, started something, that kind of stories okay. I want. But first, let's <laughs> just uh, burn out thing. <laughs> All right. Well, burnout um, is it's an important topic for me because I first off I've had it before, even before um, Free Tech Panda, and I had it again back then. I just didn't realize it, and that was my problem. So um, burnout is a, a burnout or stress or anxiety. It, re it really doesn't matter how you call it. If you feel like you're physically being impacted by the stress in your life, you're at a moment where something is going wrong, right? Because um, Particularly with um, Feedback Panda, we were just two people. You are absolutely right. We didn't hire anybody for the operational part of the business ever. We had people doing blog posts for us. We had people um, doing some social media work maybe. But the customer service, the running the project, um, design, the development was all just us, the two of us. And all the technical stuff was on me because I was the the engineer, the CTO of the company. And if you're running a business with 5,000 people, there's a lot of responsibility to make it available to them because they all pay you, right? They all pay you money. And every single one of them, particularly teachers, they're not a well-paid bunch, right? They don't make lots of money. So they give up a significant part of the money that they have to be able to use your product. So they expect it to be there for them. So when, when I had these moments where the integration broke that we had with the, the web-based classroom or where the service went down or there was connectivity issues because AWS decided to turn off the whole American instances because they had a couple of outages the last years. So when stuff like this happens, I am the only person that can deal with it. There's literally nobody else who could meaningfully deal with these kind of things. And even thinking about it now, I get like hard... Uh, heartbeat problems and, and stomach issues because it was a real physical pain. If you have to wake up at three in the morning because some automated thing calls your phone and there's a, there's a server alert, you have to deal with this and you have to get up. And at some point you develop some sort of um, Pavlovian response to a phone call or to the intercom widget. When it, it goes off and off and off, you know oh, something's wrong, right? Still today, when I go to a website and I hear the little intercom bubble going off, I just like, do I have to solve the problem? Really, it still is there, physical response to a sound. And that is a point that we should never have reached. I should have hired a replacement for my, my work much earlier, and I never did because I thought I could deal with it. I could deal with it until today. I can deal with it tomorrow, which is the slippery slope argument, just in reverse, right? It's uh, pointless. It's, it's, it's wrong. It's illogical. But in my state there, I was thinking, if I don't need to hire a full-time person to do this job, I don't need to hire anybody, which was stupid. It was like flat out a stupid thing to think. But it was just me trying to be this super entrepreneur doing everything at the same time. And I highly recommend against that because I'm still right now at this very moment, I'm dealing with the physical responses, right? Even talking about this brings it up. And um, as much as it hurts me, I talk about this because I want to avoid other people running into this trap. If you can hire, if you can make a sound financial decision to hire somebody to take off the things, take over the things that you don't want to do, you don't like customer service, hire somebody doing it part-time. So you have like six hours in a day where you can code or you can do product or you can do marketing or outreach or whatever. If you don't like building fixes for your 
backend that you just hack together, hire a software engineer so you can deal with customers because you love talking to them, right? It is really find somebody who loves what you don't love and give it to them and do this until there's nothing more that you don't love. Either you, you, you're completely out of the company by then and you just love to own the company, which is fair, or there's this one thing that you still want to do and other people do the work for you that you don't want to do. Um, that, is, that is very important to me to talk about. So burnout happens at many different points and anxiety and stress play into this. They will get you to this. If you don't stop and if you don't give other people responsibility, you will find yourself burning out. And that's the worst that can happen for bootstrap business because there's nobody who can take over if you haven't taught them how to deal with it. And the funny thing is, when we sold the business, we had to replace ourselves, right? We had to find replacements for Danielle as the CEO and for me as the CTO. And we had to hire our replacements. And you know what? It was super easy and it was extremely fun. And had I known that it was gonna be easy to find a replacement for me as an engineer and replacement for my customer service duties, I would have done this years earlier. And now that I know that, I will do it much earlier next time. Should I ever build a new business, you know? But that's, that's a painful learning, like a physically painful learning. I hope that um, satisfies your your question here. Well, yeah, yes, and uh, I would re really like to stress this out. Uh, I mean, to, to people who, uh, who are new into this, I mean, I never experienced this because I didn't. Uh, I, I'm not. Uh, I didn't have that uh, successful pro project so far. But uh, uh, sooner or later, if if you are uh, building things, th this could uh, pop up, and uh, it's pretty much important. Sorry for the flashbacks. <laughs> sorry oh, <don't> for <laughs> sorry I, for I, that. I but that. Uh, <laughs> I, I think uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a uh, pretty much important uh, topic to, to just when you realize that things are as you said physically uh, have some physical impacts or I don't know that's ruining your life or it doesn't it's not just uh, worth uh, anything but yeah, yeah the second topic now this uh, do you can you think about any of uh, funny moments or I don't know from <laughs> well, the early the, days some you, you know what my, whatever. what my problem is with this question? I'm, I'm too positive of a person to think of things negatively in retrospect. You know, we were talking about this kind of um, connecting the dots backwards um, earlier. And I feel um, even the stupid stuff I did, like quitting um, my studies over World of Warcraft, right? I was, I was playing World of Warcraft back, back in 2004. The uh, Blizzard back then released this wonderful game or they had done it in three or something. I don't really know when they released it, but I was there from the beginning and it got a lot of my attention. It got like very unhealthy amounts of my attention. And um, I, w I had just started, uh, started studying computer science then. And for the first couple semesters, I was doing really well. I was, uh, I was learning a lot and it was like um, coding was there and, and theoretical science, which is the part that I like most. And, practical, which I hated most, and all these kind of things. Studying was cool. It was interesting. I met interesting people. And then World of Warcraft happened. And all of a sudden, I went less to the university, and I only showed up when I needed to. And I spent most of my time at home in front of my computer, and I kind of skipped a couple of classes and didn't do a couple of the um, things that I needed to do to get the credits. And at some point, I just dropped out of, out of it completely. Um, that may not have been a smart decision. And in retrospect, I might have wanted to stick with it to just really learn more, right? Because I kind of stopped learning at this point. But what I did learn um, was essentially rate leading. It was like wrangling a group of 40 people that were working remotely. They were just sitting at home and communicating through, like it was a TeamSpeak or Ventrilo, just voice chat, um, trying to fight a boss in this game. And that was actually fun, like trying to organize a group of 40 people to show up on time, to be prepared for the fight, to, or to orchestrate the fight correctly so you could like kill the boss or something. That was something that I didn't expect to learn while playing a game. And it is something that I took into my later life in being able to talk to people, to communicate with people, to strategize. So I wouldn't really call this a problem or a mistake that I made. It was stupid back then. And my grandma certainly didn't like that, right? The, the boy had the, one of the best universities in, in Germany and he all of a sudden dropped out for, for this? What? That was stupid. Um, certainly not a, not a good um, impression that I made on my family at that point. But you know what? Led to me um, having more time to spend on my coding that I did in my free time because all of a sudden 
not doing going to university anymore and having a little job on the side a couple of days a week, I had a lot of time to build things. And the funny thing is, and this might be a story that is quite interesting. I, I went to another town, my hometown of Dresden. I, I studied here in Berlin. Dresden is like two hours away from here. A really beautiful city, which I recommend to everybody uh, who comes to Germany to visit. Um, and I studied political science and philosophy there. Also something that I didn't finish, but something that I quite enjoyed because all of a sudden I understood how society works, how people work, how power works, how e e economic structures are built, institutions, how they function. And I still coded while I was doing this. Every now and then I would still build a JavaScript project here and like a, part, a thing on GitHub on the side. And one day I got a Twitter DM, DM from um, a person that I didn't know asking me if I wanted a job. And they had seen my most recent project on GitHub. It was a coffee script project. I don't know if you remember that particular dialect of JavaScript. It was the, the whole thing, um, the, the, the biggest thing uh, at the time. So I built a little thing, built a little web platform that I thought I just wanted to try it out. MongoDB, coffee script, that was the technology of the time. And he had found that because he would search for people using this technology. And he said, well, we're a, a VC funded San Francisco startup. We're looking for people who use this technology stack. Don't you want to work for us? In a Twitter DM, right? That was 2011 or 12. And um, my grandma said, no, this is fishy. <laughs> my family said, no, you don't just go to San Francisco to meet people to see if you can work to them, like uh, paying for the flight and everything. That's not going to happen. And I said, well, what do I have to lose? This is Silicon Valley. Like for a software developer, this is like Mecca for us, right? This is the place where everything happens. And I just went over to visit to see who these people were, spent two weeks there. And I think on my, on my fourth day there, I met the, um, what was it? The, the, the product manager for Facebook Africa or something. That, like from being a guy in, in Dresden in a city of 200,000 people, not connected to the startup scene at all, to sitting on the same couch, having a beer with the Facebook guy responsible for their Africa strategy. Now that was the thing that I wanted to have happen, right? So I can also can't say I, I made a mistake there because other people told me I was gonna, but it wasn't. It was just a whole different ballgame from that point on. In, in the time that I spent working for these people remotely from Dresden again, because um, they didn't care to have people there. They, you can work on software from all over the world. They knew this in 2011. Um, what I learned there from these people within a couple months is more than I ever learned at university in many, many years, right? And um, these are decisions that I made from the gut, that I made from trusting that there was more to this that I could learn something from these experiences, no matter if other people thought they were in line with a career or not. And I've done the same thing ever since. Consulting, take a job here, I'm trying to found a business here, see this opportunity for English online teachers, see if that maybe goes somewhere. You never know, right? The whole point is that you never really know how it's gonna turn out and you can never connect the dots looking forward, but you could definitely connect the dots looking backward. And the more experiences you have, the more opportunity surface there will be. So that's what I would conclude the thought with, because it's really just about getting experience and then using it to get somewhere. Yeah, and uh, you never know. Uh, so for example, uh, GitHub account uh, where it can Thank you. Yeah, it doesn't you never even know who's have to be check it out. to be product. So this is this is this kind of stories that are uh, impress me. So uh, and uh, I, I also always saying to people just start doing some things, uh, throw it out there. You never know uh, what will uh, came out of it. So what will come out of it? It can be a blog post. It can be a GitHub uh, open source project. It doesn't have to be like fully. Uh, by the definition of open source, it can be some yeah. something that you just show show your work, and this yeah. is a pretty uh, nice uh, example of uh, why not. So you said why not sit on the plane, and uh, I mean there is a risk of of course, and uh, also wh when I approached you to 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 ask you to be my guest, uh, it, it was kind of uh, first uh, when I started thinking about the podcast, I I, I started to uh, I don't know first for myself to to interview some uh, indie hackers that are I don't know maybe less known and 
something like that. But then mm-hmm. I was like, why not maybe asking some, I don't know, people who are already uh, known into the, in, in this mm-hmm. industry. And I was like, why not? So sending yeah. a message, you accepted, here we are talking. Yeah, so, it, exactly. It, it, I feel this whole uh, theory of ask and you shall receive, it, particularly in our community, in our industry, you really only need to jump over your own shadow and just send that message. Like you, you, you can, and no, it's not going to hurt you any more than not trying at all, right? Like if you if you don't ask, you the no is the default anyway. So you might just as well. It's the same for me. Like when I started building my audience, I also reached out to people that I thought I could never talk to, and turns out I had chats with them. I did workshops with them, right? And like all these kind of things, they just happened because I asked. And you did the same thing. And that's, that's I, I read the message earlier because I because I wanted to see it again. And it was like, you, you had this whole text and everything. And my response, yeah, I'd love to, right? Yeah, because that, that was great. I see that, that you want to build something. I see that you want to do something. So how can I not want to be part of something cool? And, and and honestly, like you can be as famous as you want to be. Everybody wants to do something cool. Everybody wants to do something that helps other people. So if you can do that with somebody, just ask them if they want to be part of it. If they don't have time, well, then ask somebody else, right? Or if they don't have time, but they could do it a couple of days later, maybe reschedule for that. Like you just really need to ask. And that's the, the people that I see being successful that be in public are the people that are not shy, uh, to, not too shy to ask. Could be asking for a retweet in the post, right? I, if, you, if you do a whole thing, if you have a, um, if you're looking for a job on Twitter, you, I'm looking for a job. I can do this, this, and this. Retweets appreciated. All you need to write, and then you get one from me. It's as easy as, as it is. You might also get one if you don't ask for it. But if you ask, then it's not a pain for me to retweet your thing, right? It doesn't cost me anything. It doesn't cost me reputation to retweet something amazing that somebody has done, right? There's nothing in there. You just need to ask. And sometimes, uh, sometimes it can be, well, I mean, you can ask always, it doesn't cost you some, sometimes maybe you will get some response uh, that you think, uh, I don't know, uh, if you are just uh, sending something and you are thinking like, I'm just shamelessly pro- putting some links and uh, the other side is like, I'm not interested in, in this, that's okay, move yeah. along and yeah. So yeah, that that would be pretty much it. Uh, I really enjoyed this talk. Uh, we, we had yeah, we long longer talk than I than I planned, but yeah, I don't I didn't want to stop it. So yeah, in general, uh, some main takeaways from from this uh, episode is that uh, so Arvid and uh, Danielle built a, um, Feedback Panda and sold it for the life changing amount of money. Uh, it's not something that comes overnight. He's doing that for a longer uh, period uh, of time, but it is possible. So if, uh, for example, um, Arvid and Daniel uh, saw, saw this uh, problem around them and solved that problem, and that changed, uh, I may say, changed change their life. So it, it is kind of possible. And uh, you probably should just think for a moment and see in your uh, surroundings what's the problem that uh, you could potentially uh, solve and in this era if you are already building things and uh, everything is possible so you can achieve you don't have to I don't know look for millions or uh, users or whatever you can just uh, I don't know start with the five users start with one user start with I don't know after you have five users now think about how to get 50 users and yeah, we also talked about burnout. It's uh, also important, so not to just uh, focus on, on that. So if it doesn't work or maybe if it's too much, just take a break or I don't know, relax. Uh, if you also um, fail at some moments, that's also okay. Another project will come. So yeah, I don't know. Uh, the, the main goal of this uh, uh, podcast and uh, the episodes and the episodes that will follow each will have this some of the some of the um, I don't know topics that will uh, show how other indie hackers or founders or I don't know whoever are dealing with the same problems that you are dealing. I don't know. Uh, I don't know if you are making a Chrome plugin or whatever. Sometimes you can have the similar problems that with the, uh, that founders have with a very bigger uh, product so for example how to marketing it how to i don't know but 
of course it's on a bigger scale but uh, it's uh, the nature of the product so that's what i want to, to do with this podcast and uh, thanks uh, arvid uh, one more time uh, for joining me and uh, yeah 